Um, so for today, I have the pleasure of introducing Mariana and Denise. Um, Mariana has had a passion for infectious diseases from a very early age. She began her career at Tech de Monterey in Mexico, where she developed a greater interest in science and she pursued an undergraduate degree in immunology at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, where her interest in infectious diseases and host pathogen interactions strengthened. It was here where Mariana first came in contact with microscopy as part of her research. Part of her degree, she undertook an internship at Instituto René Rochelle in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, where she worked on parasitology. Um, she then studied uh, a master's of science in control of infectious diseases at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she uh, focused on malaria hemoglobin uh, pathies. For her work, she undertook projects in Mexico, Uganda, and Malaysia, and she was awarded a distinction for her work, and she later obtained an EMBO EVI Mallard Scholarship to undertake a PhD in the lab of Volker Husler at the University of Bern. There, she had a chance to fully specialize in microscopy in the context of host pathogen interactions, and her main focus was imaging plasmodium sequestration at the vascular endothelium of multiple organs. Um, for her PhD, uh, her imaging methods has spanned multiple scales of super resolution to whole, image, whole imaging, excuse me, and she was awarded the Edward Adolf Stein and the Graduate School Prize for a best thesis for her work. And during her postdoc, she expanded her expertise in microscopy. She did a postdoc at Harvard School of Public Health and Welcome Center for Integrated Parasitology with an SNF and EMBO fellowship focusing on plasmodium tropism and the bone marrow. And then for her work there, she was awarded a Human Frontier Science Fellowship. She did a short postdoc at the Institute of Pasteur in Paris to gain experience in electron microscopy. And um, she has joined the Center for Advanced Microscopy at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern as a research assistant professor in 2023. In addition to her scientific work, Mariana has done a lot uh, with several organizations and initiatives aiming to create equal access and equal opportunities. Um, and so with that, uh, introducing Mariana, please take over. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to go through uh, the work I've done in parasitology, as it's the scientific speaker series, but I'll also, I also left a little bit of time at the end. So this is uh, the, the, the context in which I was invited was also uh, Women's Month, which is March. So I'll talk about some inspiring women in my own career. Uh, but let's get going with this. So yeah, all my career, as uh, Andres was saying, has been focused on uh, on host pathogen interaction. So this is just a little map, and I'll walk you through the the projects that I was working on. Um, I'll walk you through this part, which is the life cycle of uh, Plasmodium. Plasmodium causes malaria, and so maybe many of you have heard about malaria. So I'll talk to you about what it causes and how we were able to use imaging methods to study different things about it. And the other disease I focus on is um, uh, sleeping sickness or caused by Trypanosoma brucei. Um, it's, yeah, human African Trypanosoma acid. But I'll, I'll walk you through the life cycles and the work I did in due course. So my real inspiration, I mean, I was born in Mexico in 19, the late 1980s. Um, and maybe whoever was there around that time remembers there were Vaccine, com vaccine and so vaccination campaigns for different diseases. So, for example, dengue was a big thing. I remember um, the government going around removing uh, stagnant water from different places because we just were in, were having a lot of uh, trouble with dengue. The same with Shaga. So you probably can see the 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 lower uh, sign also from the Mexican government. So Shaga disease is also transmitted by a vector, which is the Shaga's bog that you see somewhere there, the triatom. And so this was also very present. Malaria was very present. And I remember that I asked once my parents, like the, the campaign of the anti-cholera campaign used to say, uh, lemon doesn't kill the cholera bacteria. So this was this was one of the main slogans of that campaign because people thought that with lemon, you could you put lemon in your food and then that was it that made it safe. So I've had a long standing interest in it. And um, my first ever uh, field work 
was in Uganda, so that's the picture you can see. But I also worked, as Andres said, in uh, in Brazil, in in south of Mexico, where there's malaria, and in Malaysia. Uh, so in Uganda, that's the first time that I realized. Hmm, okay, well, in Brazil as well. Um, the 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 main thing, you know, how you diagnose malaria in the field is with blood smears, so Gimsa stain of of uh, of blood smears from from patients that show specific signs of, for example, feverish or or so on, consistent with malaria. And then it's really a lot of skill to try and first diagnose it. So how you see um, in these pictures over here, it's not really, so it's not a super high uh, amount of parasites that you find in blood commonly. So you have to have a very you know expert eye to catch them. And then the other difficult thing is doing the speciation. So plefalciparum is very, it's very lethal, much more than vivax or some of the others. So you have to be able to tell is this vivax or is it falciparum, right? So based on the on the morphology. So around that time, I, I did a lot of these. Um, what surprised me is that when you know studies of like I'm, I'm working here with malaria, and then the first time you receive patient samples, they look like these, right? I don't know if you can see my pointer. So they have, yes, some malaria, and then you see something else. And of course, this is not a controlled condition in your lab. This is the real world. And so co-infections are common. And um, yeah, again, what is this, right? How do you have to diagnose this correctly to be able to help? So that was my first uh, uh, contact with imaging in this context. And of course, the question came and soon after this started being a thing of like, what can we do to make this job of diagnosis easier, right? So now there's a lot of machine learning being applied to say, is this Plasmodium ovale or is this Vivax? Is it a ring or is it a whichever other stage, right? So anyway, the outline of, uh, of the work, so that was the inspiration. Now the outline of the work I will talk to you about is um, three main projects that I was working on and I'll mention one or other uh, here and there. So the first one I'm going to talk to you about is uh, plasmodium sequestration to the vascular nasilium. That was my PhD thesis. So basically uh, pathogen, these parasites being, uh, being so small and being parasites, they live within hosts. So this is very exciting in terms of imaging, of course, because you are imaging the host and the pathogen. But they're also very small, so you need to be able to see. So, for example, the red blood cell of a mouse is around five microns in in diameter, and so whatever is in there will be much smaller, right? And if you're talking now about organelles of a parasite within a cell, which is five microns, they're not going to be very big. Um, they're also very complex. So, red blood cells. Whoever has tried to image red blood cells, they're very difficult to image. Um, and so, yeah, different things we went through to be able to image what we wanted. But going through very quickly uh, on the, and I'll just keep an eye on the time, uh, on the malaria life cycle. So it, the way it starts is you're infected by the bias. So an infected mosquito bites you and it deposits at the skin something called sporozoites. These sporozoites, so the parasite, uh, moves to the liver. They enter to different vascular, uh, um, different vessels. Uh, and in the liver, they find specific receptors that allow them to traverse. They go into the parenchyma of the liver, they find hepatocytes, and they invade them. So a lot of work. This is an entire discipline on its own. Um, but um, so, yeah, once they, the, the sporozoite invades, they form a parasitophorous vacuole. And within it, they start what is thought to be one of the fastest replication rates in eukaryotes, uh, going from one cell, so one sporozoite to uh, perhaps a hundred thousand progeny. So once this, this, and this is supposed to be silent, so this is incorrect nowadays to think of it as silent because there, there is some, you know, uh, pathology going on while this is happening, but this is not per se what we know of as malaria symptoms, right? Some, someone having fevers and so on. This doesn't start at this point. Um, so when this one time asexual replication is complete, um, the progeny leaves the, 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 the hepatocyte in these, you know, blobs called merosomes. Those merosomes enter the vasculature, they burst, and they release each of those progeny, which are, are called merozoites, and then the merozoites invade red blood cells. Each of them can, so each of the ones that invade red blood cells can give a rise to a progeny of up to 40, more or less, and then that's how uh, the disease quickly 
worsens. So this part here, the blood stages are uh, causative of all the pathology known for malaria, so cerebral malaria, placental malaria, severe malarial anemia, and so on. And the way, of course, these are very smart parasites, all of them. So what they do is to, um, we have a major organ which surveys the blood, and that organ is the spleen. So any blood that is contaminated with anything passes through the spleen, and the spleen has its ways to destroy uh, pathogens. So what would you do if you were a pathogen and didn't want to go through the spleen? You, you know, get little hands and attached to something, right? If you think of this as like a toboggan or a water, water slide or whatever, you just grab to something and stop flowing. Um, so that's exactly what the parasite does. It exports virulence factors to the surface of the red blood cell. And those are these little peaks that you can see here. And then those peaks, th these virulence factors allow, um, so they, they bind to receptors in the vascular endothelium. And you can imagine that this causes lots of trouble because now you have disrupted blood flow in the vessels and you have sometimes blockage of some vasculature loss of proper oxygenation and so on. So this is where all of this uh, pathology arises. So cerebral malaria from sequestration in the brain, uh, severe malarial anemia for sure, because you are losing a lot of red blood cells. So every time these bursts happen, the red blood cell dies um, and other pathologies that I'll talk to you about in a minute. So this is all asexual. The parasite goes on and on during these rounds, but of course it doesn't want to kill the host very quickly. And its real goal is to move forward to other hosts. So in, at some point, it makes a decision that so not all of the progeny, but some of them make the decision to become sexual forms, which are gametocytes. These gametocytes also circulate in the blood. They move towards the skin. And then when you are bitten by another mosquito, then this mosquito takes up those forms. And then there goes uh, the sexual cycle within the mosquito, which I will not touch right now. But basically, now you have a mosquito. After a while, you have a mosquito that is ready to start the whole thing again. So that's more or less the context of malaria. Um, this is just a, a brief mention. I won't talk too much about it. But some of my work that focused and, and where I really got some expertise in super resolution microscopy was that the parasite, uh, it doesn't just in, so in the liver stages, this first stage here, it doesn't just invade the hepatocyte and then that's it, it hijacks most of its organelles. So in magenta here, you can see the parasite and the parasitophorous vacuole membrane. And in green, you can see the Golgi. So the first thing that we noticed was that the Golgi becomes extremely fragmented and then the parasite sort of uh, moves it, hijacks it all around it. So if you see, for example, in this image, there's little Golgi left on the hepatocyte and it's all gathered very close to the parastophorous vacuole membrane. So this is super interesting. We did a lot of work on that, trying to, um, trying to see why it's relevant that the parasite fragments the Golgi and what the Golgi is supplying for this, for this parasite. And it, this falls into the larger question of why is the liver chosen as the organ where this massive asexual replication happens. Of course, of course it's full of nutrients and based on all the organelles that, that the parasite hijacks, um, there's a lot of lipid exchange, lipid needed for membranes as well for, the, for the, uh, each of the progeny that will arise from this. So that's just a brief mention. I'll skip on that because we're running out of time. Um, okay, so the sequestration and complications, I mentioned these a little bit. So that was really what my thesis was about. Um, here I put a little schematic of the, uh, of the uh, red blood cell. And inside this, so this yellow thing, you can see the parastophorous vacuole membrane of the parasite. And so the parasite starts exporting. So it builds all everything de novo and exports the virulence factors to the outside. So among these rafts that you see here, these things are called Mars clefts. Um, and there are some resident proteins from the parasite that, that basically li live there and they help with loading this virulence factor, uh, factors to the surface of the red blood cell. So some work in, uh, so a lot of work in the human parasite Plasmodium falciparum had shown that without these two proteins, PFSVP1 and PVMARP1, <clears throat> the <clears throat> um, export of PFEMP1, which is the most well-known uh, virulence factor 
to the surface of the red blood cell was abrogated. <clears throat> and so uh, there were a lot of questions like, oh, they're so excited. it's so exciting that this is happening in vitro, but until around 2011 or so, it was thought that none of the rodent models could really replicate what was what we could see in vitro with P. falciparum. So one of the uh, rodent malarias is called Plasmodium bergii. Um, and the problem was that it wasn't known whether the exportome, so all of these things, whether the exportome was similar or conserved between the human and the mouse uh, Plasmodium species. So studying sequestration in vivo was still a big question mark. And what we did during my PhD was basically find um, the, the uh, equivalents of PF, SBP1 and MARP1, so these are called PB, uh, SBP1 and MARP1. And we started by characterizing where these proteins lo localize within the red blood cell, and we found a lot of consistency with uh, with what P. falciparum, where, where, where P. falciparum localizes. And so the next question is, um, what happens now, right? What if we do knockouts of these, and then we do we abrogate sequestration? And if we avoid sequestration, does that completely solve the issue of pathology, right? So we did that. <clears throat> we used bioluminescence imaging to characterize where exactly sequestration was. So this is quite consistent with what was found in, for example, there were known receptors for um, for the virulence factor, like CD36 in the vascular endothelium. So this was another paper that was uh, done before my work happened. And so we found that when we uh, generated the knockouts for SBP1 and for MARP1, the pattern of, of, of parasite distribution within the body was exactly like the one that you can see in with wild-type parasites in the C CD36 knockout mice. So consistent with uh, sequestration is, is, is uh, at least diminished significantly. Uh, we complemented then these parasites with the falciparum, uh, SVP1 and MARP1 to see whether we could rescue again the sequestration mark. And so we see here in this, particularly with SVP1 complemented with the falciparum SVP1, that it goes back to more or less how the wild type looks. So <clears throat> a lot of, um, a lot of, where the parasites choose to bind is quite interesting and a big uh, choice is the, the adipose tissue here. So this is all gonna adipose tissue, the lungs and the brain. And you can see here that when there is no sequestration, the parasites are going through the spleen, but I'll talk about it in a second. So this is bioluminescence imaging. We created these parasites that were uh, luminescent reporters and also uh, TD tomato reporters. And here you can see, so we did a lot of intravital microscopy. That was a big thing that I was establishing during all of my career, um, trying to see these parasites. And so one of the difficulties compared to other, you know, even if intravital microscopy exists, is that these organs, many of them are pathologic. So you have to be able to adapt to how you image these organs. So for example, the spleen is heavily enlarged with malaria and then it becomes darker and so on. So you have to be more careful in how you image that. Um, this is just an, a video of my intravitals. You'll see a parasite squeezing through a vessel and then going another, to another place in the flow. And then this other one is also deciding what it's going to do. Um, and you'll see it doing something right now. But anyway, my intravital microscopy was really, really fun. And we were able to basically study the whole process of sequestration um, in vivo in, in a dynamic way. Uh, so yeah, this is just a lot of the work, as I said. So a lot of the focus was really trying to image every organ that we could possibly think of. And so we, we generated several papers um, discussing how to best do it and what the findings were for parasitology. Um, another part of the work that we did was basically um, with those knockouts. So around that time in this I forgot the uh, the reference, but basically um, you heard one of the recent talks uh, about photoacoustic imaging. And so we use this as, as well. At the time, there was a big paper coming out discussing uh, photoacoustic imaging as a, as a technique to be able to predict strokes much earlier than you would see any symptoms. So basically photoacoustic imaging combines the 
uh, the the power of ultrasound and uh, laser uh, based based microscopy, and so you are able to get with a non invasive um, procedures you can map very well the vasculature in this case of the brain. So I did this with uh, the team of, of applied physics. So this is um, Robert and Spadin. Um, and yeah, what we, what, we, what we wanted to see was now that we have these parasites that are unable to sequester, how early can you uh, predict that a mouse is going to develop cerebral malaria or not? Do you see any changes in the vasculature and in the oxygenation of the tissue itself? So um, this was a lot of fun and we could see really that, so these combined with all the infravital microscopy and the other techniques, we were able to see that yes, that you can use this imaging method, non-invasive to see um, whether the, a mouse will develop complications and that this is different between the sequestering and non-sequestering parasites. Um, and the other thing we did was to, I was very lucky, uh, my, my PhD supervisor at the time was very, uh, he was very pro creativity and intellectual freedom and so on. So um, he was, I, I was reading about all these methods. So this was again, 2011, 2012. And I was like, oh, somebody made organs transparent. We should try and do that and see how the vasculature is remodeling in our various organs, right? When you have, when you have or don't have the pathology caused by sequestration, what's happening at the vascular level when you have all these parasites doing different things. Um, and so, yeah, he agreed to everything I wanted to do, uh, and it was it was great because that was a great way of learning. So that's how I got first into the, the field of optical projection tomography and light sheets, so making the organs transparent to be able to image them uh, entire without having to section. So for that, we focused on the spleen, the brain, the lungs, and the liver. Um, and that was a lot of fun. We didn't get anything. So I had around that time I was finishing my PhD. And so we didn't get something published out of it, but it was definitely a great experience to know how to clear the different organs and, and you know what the limitations and, and pros are of different methods that existed at the time. And now, of course, there's been a great boom on, uh, on all the possible methods that you can use. So it's exciting. Among the things we made transparent just before, because we could, was a mosquito. So the mosquito is again the vector of, of malaria, and so we made it transparent to be to be able to follow um, the life of the parasite within it. Um, other things we did, so this was in a in a collaboration with a different lab, was um, to try and study. So from the intravital microscopy and the mapping that we did of all the vasculature in the mice by uh, in the living mice we generated a little um, a little device, a microfluidic device, to try and see parasite blood flow uh, or parasite flow within the different channels. So this was a lot of fun, tr trying to translate uh, the in vivo uh, information to, to microfluidics. And then again, I was able to work with uh, the physics collaborators and then see the whole process of how you create a spleen on a chip in this case, or labs on a chip. And this, became, you know, it, it turned out to be useful later on in my career. I'll tell you more about that in a second. So that was more or less the, you know, a, a quick walk through what I did during my PhD. And during my first postdoc, I remained in the field of malaria. And I moved to this particular point, which I mentioned before, which is when the parasites choose to, um, whether to remain in the asexual cycle. So this is, you know, you continue like, okay, let's produce a new round, the new progeny bursts, they invade new red blood cells and so on, or to commit to gametocytes. So this is a one-time commitment and that's why it's been studied in different contexts, including game theory of when it is more convenient to just say, okay, now I make this one-time uh, decision to now become a, a, a male or a female gametocyte. But anyway, so this still happens within the host. Um, and so one thing that, that you know, where all the, all the story came, so I went for this to the Harvard um, School of Public Health with Matthias Marti. And what he and others had seen was that um, there was a, this question on, we only find mature gametocytes in the blood, but where are all these intermediate stages that we see in culture, right? We cannot find them in the blood um, in living patients. 
So there were like a huge amount of autopsy case studies of people who, who died of malaria or of other things, but in malaria endemic areas. And so what they found was that in the autopsies was that there, all, the, all these intermediate stages were in the bone marrow, right? They were uh, in these um, islands with erythroid precursors. They seemed to prefer them. And then only the mature stages were found in the vasculature and close to the skin. So, you know, when, when, when we were implementing all this intravital microscopy for my PhD, uh, Matthias asked me at some point, well, it would be great if we could see whether Plasmodium bergii, which is the mouse model uh, of malaria, one of them, whether it does that too, whether the immature forms also go to the bone marrow. And then this lets us, you know, this allows us to understand how the parasite decides to, my, so which stage decides to migrate into the bone marrow how they establish or recognize these uh, erythroblastic islands and what happens when the, the gamete site is mature, how do they find their way out of the, uh, the bone marrow space and go back into the vasculature, right? To be transmitted to the next host. So we did that. Uh, I went to his lab and then I did that almost three year postdoc in his lab where again, with the uh, lines that I had generated during my PhD, we were tracking the parasites first by bioluminescent imaging and then by intravital microscopy. We found that indeed there was an enrichment in the bone marrow, but it wasn't equal everywhere. So first I thought this is going to be an easy project because the, the cranium is enriched in, in bone marrow. So we just opened there and it's almost non-invasive. Uh, but no, so I learned a lot about the bone marrow, how heterogeneous it is in the, in the body of a host. Um, including that it loves the um, the red marrow, and particularly in the one in the heads of bones of big bones. So here I put little arrows to show you uh, where exactly you have this enrichment. So you can see here the shape of the bones uh, of these infected mice. So in for intravital microscopy, you can imagine that exposing and imaging the little leg. Uh, with the head of the bone of a mouse is very complicated, but we managed to do it. Um, and this was lots of fun. So um, basically, yes, what we defined was these take home messages. Uh, this is the little model that we came up with. So first, yes, we show that there is early uh, homing of early gametocyte forms. They cross the vasculature. Uh, at the beginning, we think that it's due to, so the parasite sequesters at the vascular endothelium there. And when it bursts, some of these forms are able to pass through to the bone marrow. But also you see here at the top that there is decreasing vascular integrity as infection progresses. So with Plasmodium bergia, it's a lethal, it's a lethal infection, which kills the mice usually within maybe eight days maximum. So in those eight days, what you see is the vascular endothelium becomes leaky. And so when it becomes leaky, there are more parasites coming through. Uh, but once inside, yes, they, they seem to move towards these erythroblastic islands. We did a whole characterization of which receptors, what happens if we abrogate those receptors, and so on. And then the parasites migrate out of the bone marrow and into the vascular endothelium and move to the skin. So the whole skin part was another project that, that I, by the, that time I had left the lab. Um, another interesting thing we found around this time was just how... Um, mature gametocytes show this incredible deformability. So they're really able to squeeze everywhere. So actually the video that you saw before was a gametocyte and you see how much it deforms, right? While it's extravasating. So that was lots of fun. And it raised again, a lot of questions that later we went on to, to, to study on, uh, on parasite migration. Uh, I'll skip this one. And so the next, um, the next thing that I did was to go to Portugal. Um, I was, you know, I, I felt that I had spent enough time with malaria and I really wanted to feel the excitement again, but still use imaging to study. And I was, I still wanted to do host pathogen interaction. So I was like, I should probably change organism. Um, and so I went to the lab of Luisa Figueiredo in Lisbon at the Institute of Molecular Medicine. <clears throat> and so she had just found, so, um, Human African trypanosomiasis is better known as, uh, as sleeping sickness. And what happens there, it's transmitted by the tsetse fly. So I think I have a diagram here, yeah. So it's transmitted by the tsetse fly. Um, this parasite, Trypanosoma brucei, it can infect not only humans, it can infect um, cattle and other animals of great veterinary importance. 
And so what happens then, or what disease is characterized by, is, in, is a disrupted circadian rhythm. So um, people used to think that, okay, so the main site for tropism must be the brain, right? So that's why the the main pathology that you find with this disease is, uh, is the, that disruption. But actually what Louisa had just found around, so right before, probably when I was finishing my PhD, was that um, the parasites prefer the adipose tissue and they form extremely large reservoirs. So just one thing to note is that while well, plasmodium is intracellular, uh, Trypanosoma brucea is not. So those are extracellular and they move around in, so they're all also extravascular. So they move around in the blood vessels, but they also move around everywhere else. So they have this very long flagellum, and I'll show you later uh, an image of a uh, of, uh, scanning electron microscopy image that I took to show you the flagellum. So they're very, very exciting to image. They're fascinating organisms, super well adapted to move within hosts. Um, so fascinating and scary. And basically, yeah, so what Luisa had, or Luisa's lab had shown was that the um, adipose tissue reservoir is super important. And she was, so this came sort of at the same time. I saw her work and I wanted to change uh, fields. So I told her this would be great, but how it started was, so she told me, I want to know how they're managing to traverse, right? I want you to do something similar to what you did before of checking different uh, vascular endothelium receptors, abrogating them and seeing what happens to tropism. And where I started was like, well, we don't know if the distribution of trypanosomes are equal along the different vessels, right? So the first thing we might have to ask is, um, are they already preferring the vessels of the adipose tissue and then the crossing is just proportional? Or are they accumulating somewhere else? Or they're crossing equally everywhere and then they manage to survive in the other positions? There are so many possibilities. So again, we did intravital microscopy in all the organs we could think of. And we made these little maps. So there were so many. Uh, we followed this disease throughout 20 days in all the different organs. And you can see here in intravascular parasite load, this peaks. So the, the, the more yellow this is, the higher the parasitemia. These peaks correspond to what is well known of this disease, which is uh, peaks of parasitemia. And this is because uh, the parasite changes its code, if you wish, DSG code, which the immune system of the host recognizes. So basically, at the peak of parasitemia, the host <clears throat> is already recognizing all of these. It eliminates them, but some population with a different code uh, remains, and then they start replicating, and then again, there's another peak. And like that, right? So a lot of the of the uh, yeah, a lot of the energy of this parasite goes into producing those codes alone. So anyway, we found these, so that was reassuring. And then we found that it, in the, the extravascular parasite load, it wasn't just the adipose tissue that was being preferred, but also the pancreas. And the pancreas was actually extremely heavily invaded. The kidneys, particularly the adrenal gland, was very heavily invaded. And then we had other organs that did some other interesting things. So, for example, the spleen and the liver were heavily invaded early on in the infection, but not later. So from my work in Plasmodium, we know that sometimes these parasites, what they do is they basically invade in high amounts. So they send like these suicide parasites to go there. Those parasites manage to destroy the organ or its functions, basically, you become something that's called asplenic, which is mean, which means you have the spleen, but it doesn't perform the functions that it's supposed to. So, um, so yeah, that was interesting to see in terms of what the tropism is. But the more interesting part, uh, one of the more interesting parts for me was as well that indeed the parasites don't don't uh, distribute equally along all the vasculature of the host, right? So you can see here the different groups that I was able to find where some, some vessels are not enriched at all. So for example, the liver, the spleen, the lymph nodes, they don't have a particular enrichment of parasites. Whereas say the ones in the adipose tissue and the brain do, regardless of whether they're arteries or veins, the pancreas and the lungs are enriched regardless of whether they're arteries or veins. They're heavily enriched everywhere. And then in the heart, there's more enrichment of parasites in the arteries than in the veins. So this indicates something much more you know, active, something that the parasite decides of where to go. 
the other thing that we wanted to see was whether, again, like what I had shown you for the bone marrow and, and plasmodium, whether <clears throat> this decrease in vascular uh, 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 or increase in vascular permeability, whether that also contributes to, uh, to tropism in the different tissues, but we found that not necessarily. So basically we, we injected mice with histamine and so to, to increase this permeability, and we saw that the relative enrichment of the organs didn't change that much. So it's actually, again, a decision of the parasite where it goes. Um, and the, the last thing, we a so big part of that work was to characterize which receptors seem to be upregulated or downregulated and what happens when we uh, block those receptors in terms of tropism. And indeed, you see here many interesting things. This paper that I'm referring to in this slide we focused mostly on the adipose tissue and the pancreas. So you see here ICAM2 and CD36 seem to be important, the lungs as well with CD36. Um, but these two uh, here really deserve a lot more attention um, in later on. So again, within because this is intravital microscopy, you can see here these parasites moving. They're fascinating to watch. Um, I really had a lot of fun while I was doing this. Uh, but this, one of the things that, you know, jumped to me while I was doing the images was that all these parasites don't look the same. They're not like each other. And when I compared these to the counterparts in the bloodstream, for example, they really weren't looking the same. So I thought maybe let's characterize based on all of these images that we have, let's characterize whether how different the parasite population is based on which organ they decide to invade. And so we went on to characterize them in different ways. So this was the cell cycle progression. This is uh, usually done by counting the number of nuclei that the parasite has and the number of uh, kinetoplasts, which is another organelle close to the head here. Um, so that the level of differentiation. So these parasites are reporters. You see here this green little, uh, so the nucleus. So PAD1 GFP, that's a reporter of it becoming a stumpy form. And again, like in malaria, the stumpy form is, well, not malaria, but uh, the stumpy form is the, um, the form that is uh, uptaken by the tsetse fly. And then, you know, the sexual replication goes on in the tsetse fly and then it's ready to transmit to a different host. Um, morphology was another factor that we checked, which is basically how long and how wide these parasites are. And this was, this was huge as well. And then the motility type and speed. So whether they are basically swimming or how exactly, um, how exactly they're moving, are they circling around only, or they're actually traversing up and down or, you know, how fast they're moving and so on. So we, we did this, um. One of the papers is out, which is focusing mostly on the comparison between lymph nodes of different organs. But uh, we're working still on a paper which is uh, basically describing that, but for all the different organs, so brain, lungs, heart, kidney, etc. So this is just um, an image of how, so this was a huge amount of data, a huge amount of work. And then basically this overall clustering shows considering everything we measured. So density and survival, cell cycle progression, morphology, motility, taking all of these factors into consideration, we can see here that say, um, the parasites in the blood are significantly different to the population that's, that lies in the, uh, in the lymph nodes. And within the lymph nodes, you have these two major clusters. One seems to be the lymph nodes in the abdominal cavity, uh, thoracic abdominal cavity, and then the rest of the lymph nodes everywhere else seem to have a different, slightly different population. So that's, um, those are the bigger projects. I later went to Institut Pasteur where I focused on this very interesting um, structure, which is the paraflagellar rod. Um, and I also managed to, again, do some microfluidic stuff to uh, analyze. So one of the complications of imaging trypanosomes in in vitro is that they swim very fast and so any method that we had to be able to image them consisted on for example lowering the temperature so that they become slower or etc right so these are or, or, or binding the flagellum so that it cannot swim and then you image everything else but we found that this could be artificial right because you are now holding the parasite in a certain way so we wanted to be able to image it free swimming and so what i did was this 
uh, this project to produce microfluidic devices to trap them and then image them free soon. And with this, I'd like to thank um, all the uh, sorry all the labs that I belong to during all this work. So Volker Heusler and his lab, Matthias Marti and his lab, Luisa Figueredo and her lab, and Philip Bastan and his lab. Uh, right now, I'm at Northwestern University, like Andres was mentioning, and so I want to thank my team here as well. And so, just last but not least, before the questions, I just want to say, because this was in the in the con in the context of. Um, women and girls in science day i really want to thank these different women who made such an impact in my career uh, i think the first one among them was was caro she was a postdoc in Volker's lab and she taught me so much of imaging right uh, just so much expertise and um i really learned how to uh so the the, the selflessness in the knowledge and in the in, in sharing time and knowledge with the with the team that was really fantastic and just how dedicated to uh, what it takes to establishing protocols, to bringing a new technique into the lab and so on, right? Um, Isabel Roditi was also one of the very first. She gave me one of the best pieces of advice around that time. So she told me, well, you're going to be here. She wasn't my PI, but she was a neighbor PI. And she told me, you're going to be here every, you know, almost every hour of every day for the next, whatever, five years of your PhD. So probably some of the relationships you'll make here are going to be like family. Uh, you'll, you'll probably find some of your best friends here and so on. Um, so think of that as well. And I, I really did. And she's remained a great mentor all this time. Um, then Elena Levashina also gave me one huge piece of advice, which was um, I went to her. She asked me, she was my EMBO mentor. So from the EMBO fellowship. And she asked me, um, what, do, you, do you want to become a PI? I said, yes. And she was like, but you've never worked for anybody who even looks remotely like you, right? So what do you think the challenges will be of you as a group leader? Like, have you thought about that? And I was like, oh, I haven't. Uh, and it was great. So that was another uh, big step in my decision to join Luisa's lab, who was my next boss. Um, and so I learned a lot also from Luisa. She was great. And there I also met Sara, Sara Silva Pereira here in the middle, who has been a fantastic collaborator all this time. Um, and since then I moved to the team of Dina Arvanitis at Northwestern University. She's the director of the Center for Advanced Microscopy. And, uh, and I've learned so much from her as well. So really, uh, she's really selfless with her knowledge, with her time as well. And it's fantastic to see how, uh, yeah, how she leads a team and a facility and how she interacts with this. I feel sometimes maybe not so much in the US, but I felt throughout my career that uh, that imaging was a, a very uh, man dominated field. And so for me, it's been great to see uh, yeah, women in, this le in, in leadership roles being such fantastic mentors and role models. And so with that, I want to finish and thank you all for your for your attention. And I'm open to questions now. That was fantastic, Mariana. I have a question. So you've ex you explored different um, imaging modalities and across different scales. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I have is like looking at cells in a certain like maybe in vitro environment versus tissue. Mm -hmm. How does that like morphology connect you know, since you've looked at so much intravital, you've seen actual tissue level mm -hmm. um, stuff. And I saw in your talk that there was some like morphology quantification things. Does it, does it really connect to, do they look similar like in vitro when you've done, you know, some of these assays, especially with your microfluidic work? No, they don't really connect. So with the trypanosomes, um, there are forms that not only I, but other colleagues that then started seeing them, they were like, I had never seen something so big or so fast or so whatever. So there seems to be a unique uh, preference. So this was a big thing that I, that I you know, I'm, I'm trying to work right now on, on mathematical modeling of these, uh, of, of these. So how, you know, based on all the imaging that I took. Um, and I think it's a feedback loop. So yeah, the parasite leaves the environment. So imagine that they cross out of the blood, the bloodstream, they go into the adipose tissue. And now this adipose tissue has specific biophysical characteristics, right? Not let alone all the nutrients and all the different things that could affect um, how the parasite behaves, but it's also viscoelastically very different. So it's 
fatty, it's more, uh, uh, how to say, dense. And so how does the parasite have to adapt to that? But OK, it adapts to it. And one of the things I've, I saw during the intravital microscopy was the flagellum poking into the lipid droplet. So there must be a release or some form of mechanical pressure on the tissue. And eventually, that tissue changes. So I mean, Luisa's lab showed that the uh, that lipolysis is a is a huge thing that happens. I saw it in my own mind. So you, when you have a a fat pad that reduces its size by you know significantly, I, I would be making it up right now. But I think it's you know a, a huge reduction you know, to to twenty five percent its original size or less. So the pancreas, for example, becomes completely fibrotic. It also diminishes in size. So now this tissue changed. So how that affects now the parasites that are there, you know, it's a it's a it's a loop. And so that's what makes it fascinating. But yeah, to your question, um, they're very different. So I think there's a huge uh, there's huge knowledge coming from the in vivo studies. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Please drop any questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself. 